Hey everyone, welcome to the next episode of View from the Right. With me as always is Paul Kersey, I'm Gregory Hood, and today we are going to be talking about that jewel of the Caribbean, the most wonderful country on the face of the earth, and truly a role model for all of us. And I refer to, of course, uh, Sandomang, I mean Haiti. Haiti, uh, the great abolitionist dream, the great decolonial experiment, uh, the first country in the world that was the product of a successful slave revolt, and now currently going through some unpleasantness, no doubt caused because the, uh, the French called in some loans 200 years ago, and that's directly responsible for everything that's happening today. Paul, I got to say, it's pretty incredible how, you know, even just a few years ago, everybody would have taken for granted that Haiti is a land with how should we put this delicately, with certain troubles that are very persistent from age to age. Nobody thought of it as a good place. Uh, you would see jokes about it, and I'm like Family Guy and things like that, that it was always a disaster. Uh, the specific joke on Family Guy, I think, was like Godzilla going up to destroy it and seeing that it was already a bunch of burning tires and everything, and he just like creeps back into the ocean embarrassed. But then, of course, a few years ago, when President Trump was in office in that golden time, he made a reference to Haiti and some other places being an S-hole country, shall we say. Uh, we are very particular here at American Renaissance. And the response of the media and the chattering classes and the celebrities was really remarkable the way they did it. It's not that they pushed back against Trump directly. It's that they felt the need to defend Haiti not just as a model place, but as a place that's actually better than the United States. You know, Haiti is one of those places, Mr. Hood, that you really don't want to read the history of <laughs> because yeah. it, it destroys every illusion that you have about why so many great men were part of the American colonization society because they knew and they had heard stories about what happens with a slave revolt. I mean, uh, let's let's not beat around the bush. Haiti yeah. was founded as the first black republic on the blood killing every white frenchman again it's so weird to have to say call them white frenchmen the, the you know the french back in the revolution of san domingo that stoddard i believe he actually wrote his doctorate um at harvard uh elder stoddard uh the revolution yeah, he did he did a number of, he did yeah san domingo uh, Santo Domingo was, you know, what the Spanish called it, but of course, Hispaniola is divided between the Dominican Republic and Haiti. And what's interesting, of course, is while the, everybody's freaking out about Haiti, the one country that they know with absolute certainty is not going to lift a finger to do anything about it is the Dominican Republic. The Dominican Republic hates Haiti. They have border defenses that put ours to shame. Well, that's not saying much. They have border defenses that put the Egyptians' border defenses against the Palestinians to shame. <laughs> they, they every few years, you know, these so-called human rights advocates cry because the Dominicans will round up all the Haitians that illegally immigrate into the Dominican Republic and throw them out. Of course, the Dominican Republic does not care. Uh, Haiti repeatedly invaded the Dominican Republic ever since gaining independence. The people who know Haiti best want nothing to do with it. But you make a very important point, and this is something that I think a lot of people don't really understand. The founding fathers were around, obviously, and they were they were tracking these things closely when Haiti gained independence. And it was seen as the ultimate example of why they couldn't give in to abolitionism, because they said this is what happens. Because what happened with Saint-Domingue, Saint-Domingue was the wealthiest colony in the New World, not just the wealthiest of France's possessions. It was, it was better than the 13 colonies in terms of the money it was generating. Obviously, it was built upon slavery and a particular form of slavery far more brutal and far more exploitative than that which existed in the American South. In the American South, uh, the American South is one of the few slave populations in history that increased over time through natural increase. It wasn't just be right importing new people. In fact, the slave trade was restricted fairly early on in American history. But they had families, they would have kids, and the slave population increased that way. There was a certain expectation that you take care of the slaves, if only out of self-interest, because they were valuable property. But, you know, over time, that, that certainly developed into a – I'm not going to say it was a good thing, but let, let's call it a more benevolent form of – supervision than what exa existed in Haiti. In Haiti, the average lifespan of slaves, I think within three to five years, 50% of them were dead. There was absolutely no reason to take care of them. Uh, sugar cultivation, which was the main crop, is far harder to deal with than tobacco or cotton. 
and far more dangerous. And so when these slaves would die, you would just kind of throw them out and get a new one. And they were brought in all the time. I think actually when the revolution at Saint-Domingue took place, 70% of the slaves were actually born in Africa at that point, had been born in Africa, I should say. So we're not dealing with, I mean, it was a very different kind of slavery, but it was also a very different kind of slave population. And yet when it got going and it got going because it was happening at the same time as the French revolution, because the whites who were not very numerous, there were only about 30,000 whites, about 30,000 free colors. And I think about half a million slaves, black slaves, they were still able to keep the slaves in awe when they were united, but the coloreds and the whites were divided among themselves, chiefly because of political things, but also because there was kind of an abortive move toward independence and everything else. And that instability trickled down into the slave population. And then you saw the revolt and the revolt culminated, of course, with John Jacques Dessalines slaughter of every single white Frenchman left in Saint-Domingue. It actually was not as People like us might even say it was not actually the slaughter of every single white person on the island. Uh, there were some American and British merchants and some other people who witnessed a lot of this and were left alive. Uh, it was the French specifically who were slaughtered. Uh, there were also some Poles who Napoleon had sent over during the Leclerc, Leclerc expedition who actually defected to the Haitians. They were allowed to stick around, too. But every single white Frenchman was killed. And this is important because for a very long time throughout the whole course of the Haitian Revolution, this went on for years, a lot of the white French threw in with the slaves because Toussaint Louverture and other Haitian leaders had said, we are going to have a Haiti where race doesn't matter, where it's colorblind in law, where we don't discriminate where everyone's going to work to, we're not going to have slavery, but we're going to have cultivators and everyone's going to work together to make this a prosperous island. And we're going to let bygones be bygones and the grievances that pass go away. And we're going to build a new future for Haiti together, all the races working together. Now, that probably sounds pretty familiar to everyone, but we see how it ended. And so American Southerners saw this and said, look, this is what it inevitably leads to. If yeah. you start spreading abolitionism among the slaves, if you let up even a little bit, they're going to slaughter us in our beds. They're going to kill our kids. They're going to burn everything to the ground. And then you're going to end up – it went on for decades after the Haitian Revolution. They saw what the country was because yeah. slavery never really ended. It was just it's kind of the same system only with black generals in charge. No, I mean Haiti is just such a fascinating story because, again, we saw so much – in the infancy of the country with the American Colonization Society. I mean, the, the true heroes of American history, Francis Scott Key, Henry Clay, Daniel James Webster, Madison. James Madison, these were the men. Yeah, Liberia. Yeah, yeah let's, I, I, I mean, just to fill in some of the readers who, who yeah. may not know, the American Colonization Society, which existed up until into the 20th century, uh, I've often thought me and you should restart it. The purpose of the American Colonization Society was to, was to end slavery, take the blacks, send them to Africa, specifically to Liberia, which would be not a colony, but an independent state, which with American help would help the blacks start a new life uh, back on their own continent. And of course, some blacks did go back to Liberia. That's why Liberia exists today. That's why it has a flag that kind of looks like ours. That's why the few American blacks that were sent back basically became the governing elite of that country until relatively recently. Uh, amusingly enough, many of them also became slaveholders back in Liberia. And the reason for this was because there was a recognition that even if you were opposed to slavery, and most of the founders were, uh, it was only until you started getting guys like Calhoun where they started defending slavery as a positive good. That didn't really happen until the 1830s. But around the time of the American Revolution, most of the founders, including the people who owned slaves, Washington, Jefferson, et cetera, they saw it as a necessary evil. They had been born into it. It's not like they decided to become slaveholders. This was what they had to do. And they might have misgivings about it, but when you see what happened in Haiti, you realize the choice is between maintaining the system we have or we all die. And the country is completely destroyed. And that was the trap they were trying to find their way out of. Now, interestingly enough, of course, during the Black Lives Matter protests a few years ago, you always saw Haiti as the example that people were pointing to. You saw signs saying that 
Haiti was round one. This is going to be round two. You saw <laughs> signs uh, hailing Jean-Jacques Dessalines, who was, of course, the person who directed the slaughter of white French. Uh, he then became the first emperor of Haiti before he was basically torn apart by his own people a few years later. But they always forget that part. They they see this as a model, and it's reminiscent of what people were saying about you know October seventh after the uh, attack on Israel. People were like, oh well, what did you think decolonization meant? This is what like resistance looks like. Obviously, if you start arguing about Israel, you're going to have a lot of divided opinions uh, within our own movement. But if you talk about Haiti, if we bring the conversation to that, you saw the same sorts of things being said about that. This is what it means to have decolonization. This is what it means to really oppose whiteness. And this is what it means to be a true anti-racist. And certainly we've seen in the United States, uh, particularly when you have localities trying to honor people like Nat Turner and people like that, people who were trying to create a violent slave revolt that would slaughter the whites and that this would be defended as necessary and good and just. And of course, you know, who was the one guy who they try to defend all the time and who was gone in the American imagination from a violent lunatic who single-handedly brought the country to the brink of the Civil War to now as an idealistic, harmless, fuzzy hero, of course, John Brown. Yeah, John, John Brown. Brown I mean, Harper's, yeah, Harper's yeah, Ferry. Yeah, Harper's Ferry. I mean, of course, and how did John Brown begin his famous slave revolt by shooting a free black man in the back? And then he you know, killed the mayor of Harper's Ferry and a lot of other people before Robert E. Lee <laughs> and some U.S. Marines heroically put him down. You know, one of the but, great stories, if I could tell you, in American history mm -hmm. is when John Brown was hanged and a gentleman who I consider a great man attended his hanging and he volunteered to be a um, he volunteered to dress up as one of the soldiers. He wasn't enlisted. He wasn't an officer, but he was a gentleman who said, I want to be there to see this moment when John Brown is hanged because he tried to wage war on white Southerners. And I'm only referring to the great John Wilkes Booth. Yes, John Wilkes Booth was there in attendance the moment that John Brown was hanged because he wanted to see somebody who wanted to kill his fellow white people hanged. And it's to me, that's like the ultimate start to a movie. I know you laugh at the pop yeah, culture references, incredible. but it's when you think about when you think about how much the world changed in the six years, you know, Harper's Ferry was 1859. You know, Lee Jefferson Davis is the senator from Mississippi. Lee is basically the mo one of the more revered members of the United States military uh, from his ex from his exploits at West Point to what he did during the Mexico campaign with uh, with all the with all the officers who would go on to um, fight for the Union. And it's just it's one of those moments where you realize, you know, it's like, wow. Had only Douglas won, <laughs> we would have looked at a very different country because just quickly bringing something up here, talking about repatriation and stuff, you know, there are two very key moments that we, we need to talk about real quick because white Southerners were always aware of what was going on uh, in regards to what you talked about, the Nat Turner situation. But in 1822, Mr. Hood, there was a plan by a black freed man by the name of Denmark Vesey in Charleston, South Carolina. He planned to basically lead a slave revolt of up to 9,000 black slaves, and they were going to kill every white American in the city of Charleston and then burn the city to the ground. Um, and then he planned to sell to sail with those free slaves to, to Haiti. <laughs> Seriously, like this was the plan. Now, luckily, it was put down. It, it never happened. Uh, several co-conspirators were arrested, and uh, they were found guilty and sentenced to death. And Vesey was executed on July 2nd, um, back in 1822. Well, guess what happened in, 1940, and, uh, in 2014, Mr. Hood? Let me guess, the city built a statue of him? There is a statue of Denmark Vesey in Charleston, South Carolina, a man who planned to lead a slave revolt that would have killed every white person, replicating what the Haitians did. I'm sorry, what 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 became the Haitian people uh, to the to the to the white French. I mean, you think yeah. about the context of this. This is the, the the revolution of San Domingo went on from about what 1789 to about 1794, and then I mean, I depending on depending on how you 
to find the start of it. I mean, yeah. it, it, Haiti became basically independent, totally independent around 1804. Correct. Um, and, obviously, and they, during they, they, it, it's a bit complicated because when a lot of these guys were fighting, some of them were doing it in the name of the Spanish, the, these slave armies. I mean, some of them were doing it in the name of the Spanish. Some of them were doing it in the name of the French king. Some of them eventually joined with the French Republic, Toussaint Louverture. Uh, basically was a soldier of the French Republic at the end until the Leclerc expedition showed up. Uh, interestingly enough, too, if you want to talk about who freed the slaves, legally freed the slaves in what was still a French territory at that point, it was a French commissioner, a white man named Santanax, who's actually the one who actually freed the slaves and was one of the great political rivals of Toussaint Louverture, because even though he was a white guy, he was the liberator. He was the one who actually freed them. Toussaint Louverture and Dessalines and a lot of the early black slave army leaders, generals, they were very willing to sell even their the guys in their own armies back into slavery just for a special deal for themselves. This was not this was not even something on the line of Spartacus. This was very much a a self-driven thing by a lot of what we consider to be the elite classes here. And there's a lot of really strange things that happen. Do you remember in Pat, when uh, Pat Robertson, the American evangelical leader in 2010, uh, after the earthquake, I believe it was 2010, Pat Robertson got absolutely ripped apart in the American media because he said, Haiti is cursed by God because they began their revolt with a dedication to the devil. Do you remember this? I do remember this very vividly. Yeah. Well, of course, this is actually true. I mean, what, the night before the revolt, they basically held this voodoo ceremony where they cursed the Christian God uh, because you know, associated with whiteness and the French and everything else. I think they sacrificed a pig or something like that, and they dedicated it to some sort of dark spirit, and that's how it began. That was what the revolt was. And there have been obviously a lot of weird spiritual movements that have kind of taken place in Haiti over the years and still continue. Uh, Papa Doc, the dictator of Haiti for a long time, and then his kid too, Baby Doc, uh, yep. would always use voodoo as kind of like a something that would add to their mystique and to their aura. Uh, Baron Samadhi and all this kind of stuff, as you saw in the uh, the great weird James Bond movie where <laughs> <laughs> where he's doing stuff in Haiti and there's all this voodoo stuff. Well, you'll laugh at this. Uh, back in 1992, the World Wrestling Federation debuted Papa Shango. That's right. Oh, I remember Papa. It's yeah, the Golden Age. Uh, We're dating ourselves, uh, but I remember that yeah. very well. <laughs> yeah, he, he, was, he was portrayed by actually a pretty good guy named Charles Wright. He's a, uh, he's a light-skinned black guy. He's a bouncer in Las Vegas. And I remember watching this back in 1992. I was like, oh, my God, at seven. Um hmm cast or seven or eight he cast a spell on the ultimate warrior someone i knew <laughs> and the ultimate warrior started throwing up violently and they they ran this voodoo angle and yeah i mean like you said It'd be hilarious James imagine the reaction if they tried that today but i mean again this is like what everybody knew haiti was i mean that there was this kind of troubled land built on violence built on slaughter there were all these weird things i mean the the american idea of the zombie the very idea like where the word comes from that comes from voodoo uh i, I was a white i think white yeah like white zombie i think was the yeah. first actual zombie movie uh well before correct. romero that's right and there was always this kind of like th this is a place where white people just don't go yeah like, bad things happen here but it was not wakanda it was not you know you you got decolonization you got what you wanted you 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 pulled it off and it wasn't even though it wasn't blacks rising up and heroically defeating everything that the whites threw at them i mean there was a lot more going on there was a lot of division and there were a lot of white countries that were kind of helping out <laughs> to destroy the the french presence there but let's zoom out and just say sure fine the blacks defeated all the comers now they've got this country what are you going to do with it and we've seen what they've done with it and there's a cope that well, the French wanted reparations for all this property that was destroyed, and so they were in debt. And therefore, that's the reason that they haven't been able to do anything. Well, you know what? Plenty of countries have had debt. And if they were able to defeat French invasion and attempted reoccupation and reenslavement of all these people, you would think that they would be able to overcome a request for repayments for destroyed property. But apparently they couldn't. 
they've been totally in charge of their own affairs for centuries now, and it gets worse and worse and worse. And a few days ago, I wrote something for American Renaissance. I'll, I'll get it posted in the, the notes to this. And I updated an older article that traced the ends of the different heads of state of Haiti over the centuries. And of course, there have been, I think, two emperors, a couple kings. Uh, they've tried to do a few different government forms over the years. And if it weren't so sad, it would be comical. I mean, well, all of these people are just dying, getting ripped apart, assassinated, like fleeing to Jamaica. I yeah, quick. I could jump in real quick. I think it's very important to make a point right here. You know, people who look at what's happening with black black dysfunction in the United States, they're called white white nationalists, white supremacists for just pointing out, hey, this is not normal. This dysfunction isn't. This is antisocial behavior. You know, if you were basically to have a country and go back to 1805. The, you know, we constantly hear from uh, Marxist um, historians that race was invented in the United States to kind of create this idea of whiteness. You know, who was that guy named David Rodiger, how the Irish became white? I remember reading that back in college. That was one of the first big books that pushed this idea that whiteness was created uh, out of the necessity to have this idea of white supremacy. In 1805, Mr. Hood, the Constitution of Haiti explicitly states that this is a black republic. Like they, you know, if, if, if whiteness was somehow invented, couldn't you argue that it was a reaction to the Haitian revolution where it was explicitly, you know, even, even if you're going on this nonsensical notion, because again, nat the Naturalization Act of 1790, one of the first acts of the American Congress, which George Washington signed, explicitly said only whites could be citizens, white males of good character. And, but the Haitians, their constitution is one of, is is dripping with nationalism, with racialism, with black excuse me, with black supremacy. Have you ever read this this oh, document? Yeah. Oh yeah. Uh, there's. Uh, I just want to correct you real quick. It was uh, Noel Ignatoff who wrote uh, how the Irish became white, uh, and he was, of course was the man who edited Race Trader and called openly called for the end of whiteness. And wrote he, the wages of whiteness. I'm sorry. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, yeah. Ignatoff was how the Irish became white, and he was the one who. I mean, you can guess what he is and <laughs> what his motivation might be, but he said. He explicitly called for the destruction of whiteness, and he played the little game where, well, you know, we're not really calling for the destruction of white people, just whiteness. But obviously, if you applied that to any other group, to any other religious group, to any other ethnic group, you would know exactly what they're calling for. And certainly there's – this is one of these things where when you get into Haitian history, there are some details here that kind of contradict maybe the simplistic reading. But then when you sort of zoom out, it doesn't really matter. The interesting thing about Haiti, one of the interesting things about Haiti, is that race was not actually a big deal in French law until after the Seven Years' War, what we call the French and Indian War. It was an slavery was an economic condition, not so much a racial condition. And so you would have coloreds, for example, uh, these are mixed race people who would marry whites. It was considered very common. After all, there weren't that many whites around, and a lot of poor whites who might show up to Saint Domingue wouldn't have any money. These colors who had been there might have money and property and, of course, slaves. Uh, blacks who would get freed could then turn right around if they were prosperous and buy slaves of their own. And people did this. Uh, I think, don't quote me on this, I'll have to double check, but I think Toussaint Louverture himself may have done this. Uh, certainly some other people in the revolt did this. But whiteness became introduced in the law. And one of the reasons why they did this is because a lot of the local whites, they were trying to actually break away from France and to get more autonomy. And one of the tensions in the Haitian Revolution was, was actually the metropole, it was actually France, which was pushing a more colorblind French national ideal, uh, partially out of necessity, partially to fight the British, partially out of idealism because there were all these lobbyists from Haiti uh, in the French convention saying, you need to do this, you need to do this, you need to do this, some colored, some blacks, whatever. Uh, Josephine, of course, the empress of France, uh, Napoleon's first wife was a Creole, um, Haiti. So, I mean, this is something that was near and dear to Napoleon's heart as well. The reason that race became so important though, is that 
once you actually had real fighting, once it broke out of control of legislation, once it broke out of the control of a basically, I mean, let's be blunt, a bunch of white people far away debating these enlightenment ideas and, you know, what what it should be under a true republic or whatever else, it became a race war. That's what it was. And once they finished off the whites or more or less finished off the whites, it basically became a war between the blacks and the coloreds. You can say that's simplistic and yeah, you can say this general or that general doesn't quite fit into the mold. But if you look at some of the essentially civil wars that happened after they fought off the French, that's basically what it was. And these tensions are still there today and have always and they will always be there because the thing with race is that it's like what John Adams said about facts. I mean, they're stubborn things and regardless of our wishes and our inclinations, they exist. And that's how it is with race. I mean, one of the the fundamental premises that, you know, if we're wrong about this, we're wrong about everything. It's a biological reality. It's not just a social construct. It's not something people came up one day just to justify their power. It's a real thing. And whatever laws you pass, you're still going to have to deal with the fact that human beings are different and that these differences are inherent and that they're always going to be there. And there were people might say something like, well, why didn't they get rid of racial distinctions? Why didn't they go back on some of these laws that you could argue heightened divisions? Why didn't they try to create a colony of free people where color didn't matter and everybody worked together for the benefit of France or later so for the benefit of Mr. Hood? <laughs> yeah, right. For the benefit. Yeah, exactly. For the benefit of a, of a free Haiti for everyone. They did. They did do this. Do you think people didn't know? Do you think like they didn't have like idiot liberals back then too? There were probably more of them and running around during the French Revolution. There were plenty of people who tried this. Again, it was a white guy who freed the slaves in Haiti, but it didn't work. And the reason it didn't work is because at the end of the day, people side with their own. And it doesn't matter what a constitution says. It doesn't matter what the law of a country far away says what matters are the facts on the ground and the loyalties that people have there. And the story of Haiti is really a story of the triumph of race over everything else. Now, currently what's happening, obviously Haiti has been bad for basically forever, but it's gotten worse now. I mean, I think the real thing that began was with, uh, in 1980, I believe it was 1994, which was the last American intervention into Haiti. Uh, there have been quite a few American interventions in Haiti over the years. Um, obviously, a lot of people you'll find tankies and leftists and people like that saying, oh, you know, all of Haiti's problems come from American interventions. I mean, if only if America was directly running a place, it would obviously be better off. I mean, the problem is that America is doing having kind of having the worst of both war, worlds, which is you go in, you try to deliver aid, you try to, you know, be do gooders. But you don't really have the force or you're not allowed to use the force to actually make a difference. So eventually you leave and everything falls apart. I've talked to a few people who were actually in the American intervention in 1984. Actually, when I was at William Mary, I had a professor who came in uh, for like a guest lecture. He had been in the American force that occupied Haiti and he had some videos. And again, I'm, I'm reminded of this because you just couldn't do it now. He was showing us the videos of the American intervention and – one of the things that they had a problem with is if you've ever been in the military or know people who've been in the military, a base generates a huge amount of trash. But the problem is the trash from an American military presence is more money than these people – represents more money and represents more wealth than these people have ever seen in their entire lives. So every time they just dump the trash, the Haitians would all kill each other, or like attack the base trying to steal it. So what eventually they had to do was they had to basically build an armed perimeter and keep the Haitians out. And then at a certain hour each day, they would dump the trash. And then the American troops who were armed would run away, get out of the way so the Haitians could swarm over the trash. And I'm not trying to be dehumanizing or whatever else. This is just what it looked like. It looked like ants, like when you, a candy is dropped on the ground or something like that, swarming over it scooping everything up it's just trash and within 30 seconds there's just nothing left they just scoop it all up and it's gone that's what we're dealing with in terms of just the complete inability to produce anything and the complete dependence on what other people bring in but even with all of that 
you had the American intervention to the so-called, you know, return democracy. And in the long list of Haitian heads of state, you don't get the same decapitations and dismemberings and assassinations that you get through most of Haitian history until basically you get to the earthquake, which I think dealt Haiti a knockout blow that it certainly has never recovered from and probably will never recover from. Uh, their presidential palace is destroyed. Uh, they had to tear it down because, you know, of course, Haitian earthquake quotes might uh, not quite live up to American standards. Well, I, if I could stop you real quick. Yeah, there's, a, there's a very important point to bring up before we get to the, the earthquake. From 1915 to 1934, Haiti was actually occupied by the U.S. Marines. Yes. And this Jesse was, Puller, the greatest uh, one of the greatest heroes the United States Marine Corps ever had. I mean, that was one of the things he served in was one of these Haitian occupations. Yeah, I mean, I, I mean, think about that. This is really important to American history. From 1915, this is before our entry in 1917 into the Great War, after the sinking of Lusitania, you know, blah, 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 to 1934. This is during the Great Depression, uh, going into that. We're there for, for what, 19 years? Um, and the NAACP actually sent down individuals who were upset by the fact that the United States was trying to bring civility and um, some form of order out of the chaos. And they were upset even then because there were all these negative stereotypes. There's this amazing book. Uh, it's by a British diplomat who was the Queen's, um, give me one second to pull this up because it's so funny. Uh, Sir Spencer St. John, uh, he wrote a book called Haiti or the Black Republic. It was published yeah. in 1889. And uh, it's it's considered one of the most notoriously racist books ever written because he basically tells the story. Calls it as it is. Of what exactly of what he experienced in in Haiti. And there were two versions. He wrote one that was published, like I said, in 1889. The second version came out in 1907, where he basically doubled down on his stories about cannibalism and about these women who would kill their babies and they they dug them up, then they dig them up and eat them. And just about the just utter horror, the utter horror of the island. And even and even then, in the late stages of the 19th century, you had, as you just mentioned earlier, you had white liberals who were aghast. We can't possibly discuss this because guess what? Haiti is the the symbolism of a fight against you know white racial supremacy and it's it's so obviously this black republic and we have to stand by it and and you know in 1915 the american government goes down and what does the NAACP do which i believe was founded in 1909 they send down um individuals to basically say that and you can read this it's called the truth about haiti an NAACP investigation where they're like, we have to try and counter this idea that blacks can't can't have self self government. They can't have self rule because again, this was a nation that was explicitly created for the benefit of black people and their black posterity. I believe they actually had yeah, their let constitution. Me, in the uh, yeah. Let me just read a quick excerpt from the Haitian Constitution. Yeah, please do. This is from the one of the Haitian Empire of Jean Jacques Dessalines, and I quote. Um, no white man of whatever nation he may be shall put his foot on the territory with the title of master or proprietor, neither shall he in future acquire any property therein. Amusingly enough, next section, the preceding article cannot in the smallest degree affect white women who have been naturalized Haitians by the government, nor does it extend the children already born or that may be born of the said women. The Germans and Polanders, naturalized by the government, are also comprised, spelled wrong, in the dispositions of the, sec of the present article. All exception, another grammatical error, of color among the children of one in the same family, of whom the chief magistrate is the father, being necessarily deceased, the Haitians shall henceforward be known only by the generic appellation of blacks. So it is, at least in Dessalines Constitution, and there's a there's another thing I'll read from in a bit, but it was explicitly a black ethno state. I mean, that's what Haiti was. And the whites, the small number of whites who were accepted in, and again, you know, was the white French who were slaughtered. The, the Polish defectors obviously were not slaughtered, but they essentially became black. I mean, one is reminded actually of a lot of these self-hating whites who 
pretend to be black or maybe even convince themselves that they're black, the racial dolezels of the world, this is sort of like their ultimate dream where some black guy actually comes along and says like, hey, you're an honorary black now and you get to live in our black ethno state. Here's the, the time in history when it actually happened. Of course, what was it like? And it was a complete disaster. And I mean, that's why you kept having these military occupations is because every once in a while, it just got to be too much and somebody would come down and try to restore order. But you can't because to restore order and to make it run differently than what it is, you would essentially have to colonize the place. You have to repudiate what it was explicitly stated. Right. Or and and you're not going to get blacks in this country to accept that. Which and, and I've got I've got to interrupt you and I'm sorry to interrupt you because I've never actually encountered this document. As we are doing this live, I'm reading this unbelievable document that the NAACP put out. Again, the NAACP in their infancy, one of their first acts. Yes, they w- they went to war with restrictive covenants in the United States. That was basically the reason they were founded to destroy freedom of association so that white people couldn't have uh, cities and neighborhoods of their own and you know legally discriminate. But they send envoys down because they said this in this document. They said, quote, the unfitness of the Haitian people to govern themselves has been the subject of propaganda for the last century. Books and pamphlets and articles have been (laughs) and lectures have been delivered many times over to prove that the Haitians not only were incapable of advancement, but were steadily retrograding into barbarism. An, obser- an observation of the port of the city of Port-au-Prince is sufficient to refute this off-made assertion. Port-au-Prince is clean, well-paved, well-lighted city. And then it goes on to talk about that. But again, the point is they're basically arguing that we have to defend this nation because it was explicitly created as a black nationalist state, a black racialist state, a middle finger, if you will, toward the white world. And that you know, if it if it just, you know, it was birthed out of anarchy and bloodshed and, you know, it can't fail because if it fails. Yeah, birth, right. There's, there's that, so much at stake. Decolonization exactly. as a model falls apart. Abolitionism, you could argue back then as a model falls apart if Haiti falls. Uh, Simone Bolivar obviously used uh, Haiti as a base once, I believe, maybe even more than once during some of the times when he wasn't having such a great having such great success trying to liberate Spanish America. Haiti has always been sort of the place where black radicals would look to for inspiration and occasionally flee to. But of course, the black leaders of Haiti themselves would usually end up getting chased away and fleeing to Jamaica or something like that if they weren't killed. It's important to note too, the dec- I mean, we think of like a Declaration of Independence, we obviously think of the American Declaration of Independence and the American Declaration of Independence, it has specific grievances against the British, some of which frankly are a bit unfair, but that's not really what we think of. What we think of is Jefferson stating the universal rights of all mankind. And so we sort of have an expectation when we think of a Declaration of Independence that a specific people's right to self-government has to be grounded in some kind of universal principle. But this is from the Haitian Declaration of Independence in 1804. And again, Dessalines, citizens, it is not enough to have expelled the barbarians who have bloodied our land for two centuries. It is not enough to have restrained those ever-evolving factions that one after another marked the specter of liberty that France dangled before you. We must, with one last act of national authority, forever assure the empire of liberty in the country of our birth. We must take any hope of re-enslaving us away from the inhuman government that for so long kept us in the most humiliating torpor. In the end, we must live independent or die. Independence or death, let these sacred words unite us and be the signal of battle and of our reunion. Citizens, my countrymen, on the solemn day, I have brought together those courageous soldiers who, as liberty lay dying, spilled their blood to save it. These generals who have guided your efforts against tyranny have not yet done enough for your happiness. The French name still haunts our land. Everything revives the memories of the cruelties of this barbarous people, our laws, our habits, our towns. Everything still carries the stamp of the French. Indeed, there are still French in our island, and you believe yourself free and independent of that republic, which, it is true, has fought all the nations, but which has never defeated those who wanted to be free. Now, again, explicit call to, if not quite white genocide, certainly genocide of the French. There are still French people here, the implication being there should not be. And... 
Let's be clear, it was Dessalines who ordered the slaughter, men, women, and children, of the French who were still there. French who, it should be added, were not there to re-enslave, but who were, because those people had all left. The This is well into the process of the Haitian Revolution. Jean-Jacques Dessalines actually sided briefly with the French, the Leclerc expedition, which invaded Haiti under, you know, when Napoleon ordered it and which managed to capture Toussaint Louverture, who was the main independence leader. And Dessalines was one of the people who some evidence suggests is the reason Louverture was captured and eventually died in prison in the hands of France. Dessalines was called by Leclerc, the leader of this French expedition, the butcher of the blacks because of how good he was at slaughtering the blacks that he was told to slaughter. And yet this is the guy who turns around and says, isn't it terrible that the French are doing all these things? Why can't they? you be like us, these brave liberators who have done so much to free you? It was entirely self-serving. And the best part, of course, is that even as he says, French habits and French customs and the French language and French government must be driven from the island, what is the first thing he does? He gets himself proclaimed emperor, aping Napoleon's coronation. This is actually one of the big repeating themes in early Haitian history, how much they love titles, how much they love giving themselves little European aristocracies and playing dress up, essentially. It's like kids, little kids, but little murderous, violent kids playing dress up and trying to be like daddy, all at the same time denouncing and complaining and saying that they, Europe is responsible for all their problems. I mean, Haiti is, it's perfect because in the eyes of supporters, it's the model for what decolonization was. But it's also perfect in the eyes of race realists because if we said this is what decolonization actually is, I mean, here it is. It's it's basically a bunch of mixed race people calling themselves entirely black, subjugating everything, everyone below them, denouncing Europe, but slavishly aping high European society and pretending that they're emperors and kings and Charlemagne and whatever else, giving themselves all sorts of grand titles not doing any work because they'd rather be call themselves generals in the military. I think at one point in the uh, <laughs> in the Haitian army, like a third of the people in the army were generals. <laughs> and, yeah. and the reason, of course, is that the Haitian economy developed because it was an extraction economy. It was sugar, it was coffee, it was indigo. Sugar being, of course, the hardest thing to grow. But then once they had independence, they kind of did this halfway thing of, well, we're, we're going to call you cultivators and you get some sort of a share in, in what's produced. But it, they weren't really full partners in these plantations, but nothing really changed. And it was essentially not that different from what existed before, where you could have black or colored plantation owners. It's just now there just weren't any white plantation owners, but the same system is in place. And nothing has changed from any of this. And really, that's how it is now. I mean, except instead of, I mean, they still have coffee, but instead of these plantations that are growing all these things, I mean, it's essentially foreign aid and playing games with what they get from other countries and, of course, street crime and all these sorts of things. But nobody actually wants to have a normal productive economy because sort of the outgrowth of this whole decolonial ideology is they all think they're above that that it's slavery to like work normal jobs. I mean, one of the things you do have to ask yourself too, in terms of why Haiti specifically is such a disaster compared to something like say Jamaica or Barbados, not that these places are paradises either. Jamaica is notoriously violent, but they're both part of the British Commonwealth. There was not a violent rebellion. Uh, I think Jamaica, the head of state is still King Charles, is still King Charles III. Uh, Barbados is Republic, but it's still a Republic in the British Commonwealth. There's not this idea that they exist to be an insult and to be an affront and to be a heroic opposition to the white world. They're an outgrowth from the white world. They want independence. They got independence. They were given independence. They didn't you know, violently rebel to seize it and slaughter all the British on the island. They were just given to it one day, and they still have a formal attachment to the United Kingdom. Whites still live there. There's crime, but they're not going to be slaughtered in their beds anytime soon. And 
tourism is obviously very important to both these places. I'm sure some of the people listening to this have been to one or both of those islands, and it'll forever be that way because they understand that you actually have to produce things. You actually have to trade with the rest of the world. You can't just build your entire identity on resentful hatred of whites. But Haiti does. That's what Haiti is. That's what Haiti has always been. And the result is exactly what you would expect. It's, it is what critical race theory leads to as a country. It leads to a entire nation that is nothing but a liability to all of humanity and even to the black race because it's an embarrassment. I mean, there are plenty of black countries out there that are better off than Haiti, but nobody else has kind of the, the revolutionary Elan that Haiti has. And therefore, nobody backs normal countries like, say, Botswana, the same way that people enthusiastically back Haiti. You don't see BLM protesters defending foreign countries other than in Haiti as like a model to follow. But let's look at their model. Look at what it led to. That's what they want for the entire world. And again, I don't think anything I say I, here I, or anything. I don't, yeah, think go ahead. I don't think you're wrong in what you're saying, because, again, this view and I, I got to hate to say this. We're not talking about one race being being superior, although the Haitian Constitution basically asserts supremacy. It basically well, is it basically it's not supremacy it's so not much as it's it's that whites are not allowed to do anything here and that they're not allowed to own property and that and that this is a black Republic. I mean, it, yeah, it does essentially it's, say it's it's, yeah. it's sort of a flip side to what America said with its first immigration law. Only this is the actual constitution. And and you know, an, an important caveat is that they they specifically call out, and certainly in the Declaration of Independence, I mean, they certainly explicitly call out the French as something to be utterly extirpated, which may be pretty unique in world history. Yeah, you know, it's just so fascinating because even during the Civil War, even before the Emancipation Proclamation, Lincoln was trying to figure out a way because he had he had always been a big fan of of colonization. Uh, in the 1850s. Yeah, this is one of the things I wanted to defend real quick because from John Wilkes Booth, I got to I have to speak of because I know uh, Mr. Taylor is not actually particularly opposed to Lincoln, uh, particularly because even at the end of the war, Lincoln was still. I mean, this this is something there's a lot of data over, but Mr. Taylor's yeah, Mr. Mr. Taylor is very strong on this point that Abraham Lincoln wanted to return to colonization, wanted to send these people back, and John Wilkes Booth was the one who stopped this. I mean, I can't. <laughs> John Wilkes Booth might have cursed us all forever if Lincoln no, lived, I, I, we wouldn't I, I be dealing with any right. of this. I don't think that's right because unfortunately. The campaign had already started. The Elevéche. I, I might be. I'm probably butchering the pronunciation because I don't. I don't speak Spanish. But there was a attempt by uh, a gentleman, by a white guy, who tried to bilk. As there's actually a brand new book that just came out. Uh, it's called Lincoln's Lost Colony: The Black Immigration Scheme of Bernard Cock. It was just published. I, I just actually ordered this as we're talking. Um, but I'm reading an article right now. Uh, it's actually by somebody who was at William and Mary, your alma mater. There you uh, they go. wrote a thesis on this. It was the Ayolavashi colonization venture. And as our country was in a civil strife, Lincoln was under strong pressure to find some acceptable solution to the problem of the Negro. This is from an article in the uh, Cambridge Uni Press, University Press. It was called The Americas, volume 16, number one, back in 1959. So if any of our listeners have a copy of this, I would love to get it because unfortunately I only have access to one page, but it points out that um, it became increasingly awkward to allow each regional commander to handle, to handle Negro refugees as they saw fit, returning the men and their families to their erstwhile owners. Uh, instead, basically, Lincoln decided that it was time to figure out something to do with these people. And so this guy came to Lincoln and had this idea to buy an island just off of Haiti where they were going to put a bunch of the freed slaves. And, and they were going to try and figure out a way to end the war at this point, Mr. Hood, by offering to uh, compensate slave owners for their for their slaves so they could repatriate because they realized you know, Lincoln was a huge sympathizer with – 
those advocates of separation, separation like Jefferson and Henry Clay and the members of the American Colonization Society and Lincoln in the 1850s, he, you know, he publicly denied any desire for social equality uh, or Negro citizenship. Yeah, and, and, and Lincoln wasn't even really a real northerner. He was not some New England Yankee. No, that's exactly right. And unfortunately, this book ends, this this article ends with this amazing line where it goes, where he's talk, he's given a speech uh, and he's talking about colonization. And he said, there would be no civil war today. He told a delegation, I have no idea what comes next, but basically it would be if we didn't have this problem, the Negro. And I think ultimately one of the fundamental problems in the United States is that we knew our, our the smartest men knew. Yeah, they what knew the score. The long-term consequences would be if we didn't rid ourselves of this population. Yeah, that, Thomas again, Jefferson himself. Thomas Jefferson at the Jefferson Memorial. It has the famous quote from Jefferson that is, nothing was more certain in the Book of Faith that these people are to be free. And then it cuts out the very next sentence, which is that, nor is it equally less certain that these people cannot live under the same government. And it's not just because of historical grievances. And I think the idea of historical grievances overcoming post-racial idealism is is told very well by the history of Haiti because again there were plenty of people black and white who were saying all sorts of idealistic rhetoric about how we're going to move past uh race and this is like you know in 1800 and we see how that worked out but he also said nature itself is one of the things that's going to draw this distinction and it's always going to be there we should talk about some of the recent events right now because Really, everything that's happening is an outgrowth of what happened in, well, I mean, it's entire history, but where things really went downhill, obviously, was the earthquake and then the aftermath. There was a semblance of stability up until about 2021. Uh, Jovenile Moise, you know, these French names uh, I can't quite pronounce, but he was assassinated. And just, I think, like a week or two ago, his wife was among those who was arrested for supposed involvement in his murder. The current leader, Henry, is the prime minister and the acting president, but he's not really the legitimate leader. In fact, there are no legitimate leaders because they haven't been able to have an election in so long that everybody who was in the legislature had their terms run out. So the current prime minister slash president is basically despised by everyone because they consider him essentially illegitimate, Ariel Henry. This is the man who the current, some are calling it a rebellion, some are calling it even a revolution, that the gangs are rising up trying to force out. And of course, these gangs can't really just be considered street gangs anymore. A couple of weeks ago, they attacked uh, Toussaint Louverture Airport and basically shut down the airport so nobody could have any flights, which means that the prime minister slash president can't get back into his own country. And you could say, well, why wasn't he there to begin with? He was actually in Kenya trying to get an international peacekeeping force to go into Haiti, which would be led by Kenya. And Kenya's Supreme Court had said that was a no-go. So he was setting up a bilateral deal so Kenya could lead this African force that would occupy Haiti, and that would allow him to, to reestablish control. Well, now he can't even get back into the country. <laughs> Th then they attacked a prison and freed about 4,700 people. So now all those people are running around, and presumably a bunch of them have actually reinforced the gangs. Uh, quite a few people have been killed. Of course, you're getting all sorts of reports now that cannibalism is underway, uh, although, you know, that's not particularly new in Haitian history. You have bodies rotting in the streets. Uh, the U.N. is screaming that the healthcare system is basically at the point of complete collapse and they're not going to be able to deliver food and water because, of course, there's no food and water that they have for themselves and they never will. And right now, there's a political vacuum that is probably most likely going to be filled by this guy, Barbecue, <laughs> who's like the most prominent gang leader in Haiti right now. And he's actually speaking to the media and framing himself as a kind of class war hero and saying that what we need to do is make sure that the rich people aren't hiding all the money and make, and stealing from the people and making sure that we're enslaved to the West or whatever else. He's saying that, and I quote, 
Haiti must become a paradise for all of us or a hell for all of us. And that if people don't listen to him, there could be, quote, a civil war that leads to a genocide. This is Jimmy Cherizier, who's a former police officer known as Barbecue. So they're like, why is the violence out of control? Well, a lot of these gang leaders are former police officers. Uh, For example, there's another guy named Guy Philippe who leads the Brigade for the Security of Protected Areas, BSAP. He was actually arrested, charged, indicted, uh, and convicted by America a few years ago. They convicted him of money laundering. They arrested him, but then for some reason, America sent him back to Haiti. So what did he do? He immediately started up a gang, and now he's got one of the most prominent gangs. BSAP is apparently a military power in its own right. He, of course, is another former policeman. And then you've got another gang called the Five Seconds Gang, headed by a guy named Johnson Andre, a.k.a. Izo. And all of these gangs now have not just rifles and pistols delivered from the United States, but 50 caliber machine guns and grenade launchers and all sorts of advanced weaponry. 3,000 out of the 15,000 police officers in Haiti have abandoned their posts in the last two years, and that number has probably increased in the last couple of weeks. About 15,000 people have left their homes recently just because of what's happened in the last couple of weeks, and about 313,000 have already been displaced. So that's what we're dealing what's with. Number, and certainly, what's the number that, again? 313,000 total. 15,000, well, and this number has surely gone up in the last, just the last couple of days, 15,000 have left just because of recent violence. The gangs control about 80% of Port-au-Prince. And even a few years ago, they were already controlling some of the roads and the rural areas. So, you know, if they wanted to cut off the capital, they could. Now, the one thing that you have going for you, if you're the government or some kind of peacekeeping force is that you are dealing with gangs, which means that they're just as likely to fight each other as opposed to the government. But if they're able to get their act together, if they're ever able to have some kind of an alliance, they certainly outnumber the police and they probably have more firepower than the police and probably a lot of the people in the police are sympathizing with them. Uh, kind of reminds me of the Warriors. <laughs> you have all the different <laughs> gangs. Come and out if, play, uh, right? if, some, yeah, if, if Barbecue takes the role of Cyrus and, uh, and says, can you dig it? And all the gangs join together, Haiti is probably screwed. But... <laughs> I mean, the real danger, of course, for the United States and all of this, we're not going to intervene, although people are screaming for that. And maybe they will. But I think, you know, the decolonial protesters are giving Biden enough trouble over Palestine. I don't think he wants a a Haitian intervention. I think America and of course, we're going to have to pay for it. America has already promised about two hundred million dollars for an African military occupation of Haiti. Um, So, you know, they'll do it, but we're going to have to pay for it. But the real danger, of course, is that they're going to start screaming that we need to bring all these Haitians into the United States. That's that's going to be the big thing that we're going to have a huge amount of Haitian immigration coming to this country. And they already have uh, we already have, I believe, more than 100,000, probably more than that under temporary protected status. TPS, yeah, which Biden, which Biden extended. Correct. Know, correct. It back. The same thing for Venezuelans at the same thing for El Salvadorans. I believe Hondurans as well. Which is hilarious about El Salvadorans because the reason they extended for El Salvador is they said, oh, the gang violence is so terrible. You can't possibly send people back to El Salvador. The gang violence is – it's inhumane to have people live in these conditions. So then Bukele takes over and promptly solves the gang violence problem. So we should be able to send these people home, but they extended it anyway. We're still not allowed to send – and the best part, of course, is that the U.S. State Department wants Bukele gone. Oh, it's it's I mean, again, if if you were to see some black individual come in and actually clean up Haiti, we didn't you'd have, th- then you'd see an American intervention. Then you'd, you'd see, see it immediately because what you'd have to do is basically I mean, the problem with Haiti is not what Conan O'Brien said back in 2018. You know, again, going back and putting a bow in this conversation, which I think is so important. Yeah, we should we should end with this because this yeah. is really the media image of it is that the reason they're going to say that we have an obligation to accept unlimited Haitian immigrants is because Haiti is a disaster. They'll blame it on us. They'll blame it on France. They'll blame it on whatever. That's not the point. The point is that they're going to say Haiti is so terrible. And that's why you have to accept unlimited Haitians. And it's your fault if anything bad happens, even though we already know from data in this country that, as you might expect, Haitian Americans are more likely to be unemployed, to have less money, to to be a drain on the state. I mean, but that that's, of course, why they're being brought in. I mean, if they were productive, if they were contributing, if they had anything to give the country, they'd be sinking the boats on live television while journalists cheer. But it's because 
they're dependent. It's because it'll make things worse that we have to bring them all in. But the justification for it is because they're going to say, oh, well, Haiti is so bad right now. But as you point out, a few years ago, they were saying not just that it's fine, but unlike America, which needs to be made great again, Haiti is already great. And Conan O'Brien, of course, who was making jokes about Haiti just a few years before, but because Trump said something about it, it became right coded. And therefore, you were obligated to defend Haiti as the greatest place on earth. Yeah, he was lionizing Vanity Fair for starting a, a shirt campaign saying Haiti was already great or Haiti is already great. Excuse me. And he had a show on TBS before the ratings were so bad. Where in 2018, he went down there and interviewed a number of Haitians and, you know, basically tried to say that, oh, yeah, this is such a great country compared to your country. And they all were like, oh, yeah, you know, Donald Trump is president. We love Oprah, though. She should be the president. And this article is crazy because, again, he's going down to try and create this idea that Haiti is just this paradise on earth. And again, not a Wakanda, but just a place that's stable and thriving and vibrant. And uh, I mean, the uh, the special was called Conan Without Borders, and it was based in Haiti. And there's just leave a, him there. Yeah, there's a famous meme of this, you know, six foot five, six foot six, goofy, very white, redheaded uh, Irishman who you know went to Harvard, wrote for The Simpsons, and he's drinking a, uh, a adult beverage out of a coconut. Yeah, in, in the know, ocean, right? Yeah. yeah, you know, you, you have to wonder where that photo was actually taken. Um, well, notice that they, you know, when they're taking pictures to show how beautiful Haiti is, they shoot out toward the ocean because if you pointed it toward the land, you'd probably see what it is. Even in the uh, the hotels that are like guarded, yeah, probably I mean, some of the most securely guarded place on earth. And of course, it was all Susan Sarandon was wearing the shirt. And my favorite, my favorite of all these celebrities is Bill Maher. Bill Maher, the truth teller. Bill Maher, Mr. Politically Incorrect. Bill Maher, you can't handle me. I'm independent. I say things which are even going to offend the liberals. Oh man. You, you know, I'm, I cut through all the BS and like, yeah, even Bill Maher is like, oh, Haiti's so great. It's not like that evil Mr. Trump says so. Like, give me a break. If well, we just like rounded up all these people who ever wore that shirt and dropped them in Haiti, wouldn't let them come back. They could be honorary blacks, according to John Jacques Dasseline's constitution. Not only and, that, I mean, that would be the greatest thing in their life. And we would never have any problems again. I'd actually encourage them, just like uh, the Super Bowl team that loses, when we send all their shirts to Africa. They should, <laughs> right. they should, they should take, they should take every shirt that was ever made that says Haiti was already great and pass it around to all these people, especially President Barbecue or yeah. Minister Barbecue, and say, you know, Mr. Barbecue, I want you to read this. I this is what I believe back in 2018. You know, what was that? That was, that was what five. <laughs> Uh, six years ago, almost. I mean, yeah, geez. it seems like a different lifetime. But yes. I mean, it's. But they. I guess what really, and it's not surprising. And we we should end on this because just kind of griping about what we already know is not productive. But it, it still has to be said. They expect us not to remember this stuff, and maybe Generation TikTok doesn't. But it wasn't that long ago when the entire media, as one, and it's not just stupid celebrities. It was academics. It was the prestige press. It was all these people saying President Trump is ignorant. President Trump doesn't understand how beautiful Haiti is, how wonderful they are, how they're smarter than us, how they're more creative than us, how it's better than America in all these different ways. And now they turn around. They're like, oh, it's a complete disaster. And we have to do something about it. And if you don't, don't want to do so. And by the way, this is all your fault. And if you don't want to do something about it, you're a bad person. And they just expect us not to remember this stuff, which they themselves, these same people who are still in Hollywood, who are still in media, who are still in academia, were saying just a couple years ago. And if you're like, hey, wait a minute, didn't you say it was already great? They just like look at you like you're crazy. <laughs> Mr. Mr. Ed, I've got to end with this because, again, I told you that the NAACP put out this thing called The Truth About Haiti, an NAACP investigation. It was published in Crisis Magazine back in September of 1920. This is the paragraph by James Weldon Johnson, a black man who went to Haiti. He wrote this, quote, the United States has failed Haiti. It should get out as well and as quickly as it can and restore to the Haitian people their independence and sovereignty. The colored people of the United States should be interested in seeing that this is done for Haiti is the one best chance that the Negro has in the world to prove that he is capable of the highest self-government 
if Hades should ultimately lose her independence, <laughs> that one best chance will be lost. I'm not making this up. This was written oh, in 1920. This was written 104 years ago, Mr. Hood. <laughs> I've never read this before in my life. I literally just Googled this and happened and happened to come upon this document and as you and i were that's you know i apologize to all of our listeners i've got like four computers here and i was trying to <laughs> i was trying to look at all this but this one document blew my mind because again the naacp was founded to destroy freedom association in america they went to war it wasn't until 1948 shelley v kramer when they when they defeated restrictive covenants but Think about this. They were trying to defend Haiti when it already was what we know it is today, back in yep. 1920. Yep. And, and 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 he's right. They but, like freedom of association for blacks, don't they? The, and, and again, but Mr. Hood, this is this is the ultimate thing. We're not trying, you know, I don't think anybody in American Renaissance, I don't think anybody in New Century Foundation wants what's happening to the Haitian people. No, of course not. Be happening. It's like there, there, there's cannibalism happening. There's murder. Yeah, it's not. It's not. You know, we're not sadists. We're not like getting off on what's happening. And certainly, it doesn't as bad as a lot of African countries are. As bad as black-run neighborhoods in this country even are. You can point to lots of black countries in the Caribbean that are not that bad. Where if you were yeah, like, hey, I'm going to go there for a week, you'd be like, oh, that sounds like fun. <laughs> like, it it doesn't my, need to be this way. Yeah, one of my favorite baseball players was Sammy Sosa, who was a black guy. Republic. Republic. And guess what? After he retired, what did he do? He's famous for bleaching his skin because he didn't want to be black anymore. <laughs> right. Anyways, point is this. The Haitian people deserve better, and they're not going to get better under black rule. And I think no, that is what this – and, and that's, that's it. That's – and that is the ultimate indictment of this entire nonsensical world we've been forced to live in where white people are blamed for the problems of Haiti, the problems of St. Louis, the problems of Selma, the problems of Birmingham, the problems of Memphis, the problems of Detroit, the problems of South Africa. No, you know, this 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 is ending. And I kind of think and I, I'll give it to you to end this conversation we've had here. The way that people, especially quote unquote conservatives, Elon Musk, the way that people are talking about Haiti on Twitter, on X, it's illuminating to me because it's almost like, huh, everyone's kind of looking around like, huh, this isn't working. This isn't getting better. Like they're almost joking about the cannibalism. Yeah. And it's, and the, yeah, it's actually the normal conservatives who are more flippant about it than we are. Yeah. And I think that's I think that's something that people should look at and say, the wheels are off on this egalitarian game. We have no idea where the wreck is going to end up and how bad it's going to be. But again, if in 1920, the NAACP sent this envoy down and they wrote that paragraph that I read where they basically said, we can't let this end. And here we are now in night in 2024. And we're watching in real time the type of stereotypes coming true, being video, you know, to quote the macho man Randy Savage on the telescope, we're watching it live from Port-au-Prince, the ruins of Haiti. It's like, holy crap, how, how, how can we cover up this? And you can't. And the question is, how far down the rabbit hole is Western man ready to go to reclaim what, what is ours versus allowing this world to continue to supersede on, on on our dreams. And it goes back to Elon Musk. We can't colonize Mars if the United States is colonized by Haitians. Yeah. And ultimately, that is what is going to be the next push. Uh, there, We're going to have to pay a few hundred million dollars for Africans to goof off in Haiti. Obviously, all that's going to happen is I'm sure the peacekeepers will get in trouble with uh, doing something with the Haitian people, and that'll be a whole new thing. Five years from now, we'll still be dealing with the same nonsense. Uh, the only difference is we're just going to get more and more Haitians in this country, and we'll have something similar to the Somalian diaspora here. We'll have entire neighborhoods colonized by them and demanding that we shovel unlimited money and resources and manpower to this failed experiment. But at the end of the day, I mean, maybe the best way to combat this is to say what the NAACP said in 1920 and just say, well, you know, this this is it. This is you got what you wanted. You have self-government. You have independence. And we're just going to wash our hands of you. 
we're going to turn our back and build Wakanda. Show us what you can do. But it's been about, it's been more than 200 years and we've seen what they can do. And frankly, what they can do isn't much different than what they do everywhere else. And at a certain point, white people have to say they're not our people and they're not our problem. And with that, I think I'll bring it to a close. Thank you, Paul. Thank you to all our listeners and we'll catch you next time.